Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I am Coach DeQuessa. As you know, a certified public speaker, published author, and self-development mentor who has worked with many leading businesses here in the Bahamas, but work with women all over the world to help them boldly feel confident in their goals and actually master consistency. Today, we are on the Evolving Women TV platform with I describe this lady as someone who is beyond amazing. Anissa's philosophy is that we choose to be a victim of our environment or allow it to shape our life's direction. Her personal philosophy is embodied in this statement. It inspires her and remains a goal point to become better than that which she was born into, a valuable contributor to society. She holds within her a strong vision to contribute to the wealth of the economy and indeed into the lives of individuals, creating value in organizations and people. She is passionate and I have seen this passion firsthand. She is passionate in paying it forward by influencing and guiding positively with optimism, love, compassion, and to live authentically with acceptance and contentment. What a powerful woman we have joining us for this discussion today, Grace for Our Mothers, and how to heal from the trauma that we may, experience, may have experienced as children, but more specifically, trauma related to our relationships with our parents and our mothers. And so, Anissa, I'd like to invite you at this time to please tell us a little bit about your childhood, where you're from, how you grew up, any warm memories that you'd like to share. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and for having me on your show. It really is a, it's come full circle for me to talk about my childhood and how it has served me. And part of that childhood was not knowing where I fit and how I belong for that matter. It was not knowing what my place was because I didn't grow up knowing my mom, even though my mom was still alive. And I also didn't grow up knowing my dad. And so I had many caregivers in my life. And that, that in itself is a gift, right? Having several caregivers that you can call mom or dad, that has just stood the test of time in teaching me so much wisdom. So the warm memories are that I had many examples to live with and learn by, and certainly understanding the gifts of those relationships and how today it serves me to where I am now. The fond memories of myself as a young lady, enthusiastic, vivacious, lots of energy, always seeking to find the bright side of things and always believing wholeheartedly that there is way more to life than my circumstances. Thank you. Wow, it's really such positivity that you share having, hear, having heard from you about um, a relation, a non-existent relationship with your parents, but the grace and looking at the silver lining uh, that your uh, caregivers along the years had the opportunity to pour into you and to help you become the person that you are today. Anissa, um, are there any feelings of animosity or feelings of uh, and, you know, just unhealthy feelings regarding um, not having that relationship with your mom early on? So actually, no, because as I mentioned, there were such beautiful gifts in that relationship. So part of my story is, interestingly enough, born from prostitution. And that's not something one just wants to reveal because, you know, there's the shame and the guilt and, as you say, some sort of judgment and resentment. 
But as time went by, you know, I learned that for many years, I, I was actually being the parent to my mom and parenting her along the way. So there wasn't really an opportunity to, to be a young girl because I'd already started my sales career. I always joke, started at age nine, being door to door <laughs> so that I could take care of myself. But coming back to being born a sin, I call it born a sin and being born from prostitution. There are so many profound gifts in that because today I realize that the mirror of relationships for myself is that I have personally, for lack of a better word, prostituted myself in my relationship. You know, always seeking that sense of belonging, um, finding love outside of myself. So I, I became a people pleaser, a martyr, the hero, the whatever it is to please others, just so that I could learn to belong. And along the years, yes, there was resentment towards my mom because, gosh, I didn't know where I fit and who I was. My whole identity was messed up. And not knowing my dad was equally, you know, there was a hole in the soul at first, you know, growing up, um, not knowing who, it was always, who am I? So that yearning to be someone and to fit and to become someone better than that, what I was born into was always at the top of my, of my mind yet, but passing judgment initially to mom. It's only several years later as I walked my own journey and as my wounded journey to self-love and self-worth and self-acceptance and eventually self-leadership unfolded, I realized that there was so much power in my mother's journey and that she is such a powerful, phenomenal woman that everything that she's endured in her life I actually repeat it to some extent in many different contexts, yet the radical awakening of that was learning how to come back home to myself. So for me, that is the profound gift from my mom's journey and my own personal expansion. Listen, there, there's just so much for us to talk about based on that response, Anissa. What I see in front of me today is a confident woman who has done a lot of the inner work to release the, I will call them shackles that can hold us back in life. Because really, you know, unforgiveness attacks the person holding on to it. And yeah. it doesn't really impact the person that it's directed toward, right? I wrote just, you saw me, I was writing, I was just writing a list of things because, you know, usually my conversations talk about the fact that we're born into our first tribe. And our tribe is all about belonging. Family is our first tribe. And it's where we get that sense of security and being a part of something. It's where we have mm -hmm. siblings and we have love extending from one person to the other. And, and you have that secure belonging in your first tribe as family. And the reality is many of us don't experience that with our first tribe. Many of us uh, look for love and support, acceptance outside of our first tribe because it isn't given to us. And, you know, many women can relate to searching for love. I mean, our mothers are, we are born from these women and it is their duty to provide love. It is their duty to nurture. Women are the nurturers, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. when we have an experience where other people are giving us that love, but the person that we came from lacks the nurturing that should extend to us, it still impacts us, even though we have had a good upbringing by other people. Because I see there's a Facebook user, a, a, a Facebook watcher who is saying that caregivers can be such a good blessing. And I agree, they can fill the void for an extended period of time. But there comes a time 
where we want to know more about uh, and fill the void of why didn't she want me? Why did she leave? Why did she abuse me? And so that hole that you talk about in your soul, many women experience it. I want to talk, though, about your journey to self-love, self-acceptance, and self-leadership, because that is where the true power lies. Like, things happen to us during the course of our lives, from we are born to the moment that we die. We have a lot of experiences. Some are outside of our control, like the love that's extended to us from our parents. And there are some things that are inside of our control. So for the woman out there who is struggling because she feels as if her mother didn't love her, her mother traumatized her, how does that woman come into a place of self-love? Oh gosh, I mean, firstly, I, I led to that place through compassion compassion for those in my circle especially my mom knowing that she did the best that she could with what she had at her disposal which was very little because I mean she pretty much had to start her journey at 14 15 not knowing or at least knowing she has a mom and dad too but no relationship thing so for me, the mirror of relationships is such a profound way to find the journey back to yourself. Because when we are giving so much away of ourselves, the relationship mirrors that we are faced with teaches us that, and there are seven, I think Greg Braden speaks about seven relationship mirrors, but the three that stood out for me profoundly was by far the mirror of what we see in others. <laughs> so guess what? What we see in others is often what we don't like in ourselves. So then ego plays a role, right? Yes. So we're often in our ego space there. So that's one of the mirrors that was my awakening. And then the other one was, what am I judging? <laughs> Because we are so prone to judge others. Yet, that's the ego once again, allowing us to be so in our head space, I would call it. Because when we're in ego, we're in our head space. We're not in our heart. When we're in our heart space, we're leading absolutely with compassion. And one of the other mirrors, and this was the most powerful mirror for me, in fact, I always sob when I talk about this mirror, is what have I given away? Because Greg Braden speaks about when you find yourself magnetically drawn to somebody and you may not even know them, but yet you feel like there's a powerful connection. That connection is often based on what it is that you have lost and given away within yourself. And when we do that, that's the space where we lose ourselves and we're not setting boundaries. And so when I reflect back on that journey of my mom, it, I had to learn what was that mirror of the relationship for me and how do I lead with absolute compassion towards her because whatever she's given me was an opportunity to break the generational cycle so that was the powerful radical awakening for me is that I now have the choice to break the cycle listen to me I have goosebumps <laughs> I really have goosebumps because to operate from a space of compassion right um, yeah that's for many people a tall order you know when I when I was born my mom was a teenage mom. She was uh, just on the brink of 16. And back mm -hmm. in those days, you know, teenage pregnancy was scorned upon. And secondly, she was an unwed mother, which was also scorned upon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I started to think about her journey as a pregnant teen, 
And I started to think about what could she have gone through? What was the ridicule? What was the judgment? What was the pain and hurt that she experienced as an outcast to society because she was not conforming to the rules of society by being married when having her child? I also started to think about the fact that she gave me to my great grandmother. And my great grandmother was my primary nurturer. So my great grandmother really, um, my great grandmother really nurtured me from 13 to, I mean, from zero to about the time that I was 13, but then she passed away. And after she passed away, I was sent to live with my mother. This is what I would call a defining moment in my life because during the first year that I lived with my mom, um, my mom got married and then her step, her husband, who was my stepfather, tried to sexually molest me. And um, I was again moved from that home to go to my grandmother. At a point in our relationship, I went to my mom to have a conversation because I wanted to understand her choices. I could sit back and judge, like you said, I could sit back and said, oh, she shouldn't have done this or, you know, because she did A, B, and C, mm -hmm. I am now E, D, and F, right? But I went mm -hmm. to her and I had a conversation and as she sat explaining why she did the things that she did, there were some common themes, Anissa. She was looking for belonging. Uh -huh. so she got married to a man and stayed with a man that tried to be sexually inappropriate with her daughter because she needed that love, that external love validated her. And that was important to her because she was already an outcast from 14. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. somebody loved her. And it took really compassion for me to connect with that and to be able to offer the gift of forgiveness because she had mm -hmm. a life. And then second to that was, like you said, making the decision to live my life differently because you gave me a gift. You gave me a demonstration of what not to do. You gave me a lot of lessons in what not to do. And so there was a choice now to yeah. either be a victim of my circumstances and blame my mom for every decision that I made, right? Because my mom didn't love me, because my mom did this, because my mom did that. I can use all of those as excuses for why my life is not progressing, or I can do the work to heal mm -hmm. from the trauma. So how do we then accept these circumstances? We're in compassion and we accept that our moms did the best that they could do. A lot of our moms don't share their backstories, so we don't know why. I'm fortunate to have heard why, but how mm -hmm. do we begin to accept ourselves when the primary person that should accept us didn't set the example. So now we're looking for acceptance. Like, I love these mirrors, right? What, what are the steps now that, you know, just one or two, because we can't give all the goodies away, but what, mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we begin to accept our circumstances, but in accepting, release them? Oh, wow. It took me several years because at first I was chasing, you know, success and ticking off. I was not going to become my mom, right? So I was going to become everything that my mom was not. And I was going to become everything that the environment that I grew up in. And I, I, I mean, I shared this with you before. I call it, I grew up in the Bronx of Cape Town because the environment was rife. It was it was prostitution, drugs, and gangsterism. And it was like, okay, so what am I going to do? And so I chose to leave that environment at 15, 16, right? To deliver my own. But it was born from the wrong place because I was chasing the lack that I was not being fulfilled with, if that makes any sense. I was chasing what I was not going to become. And the, the day that I chose to look at things differently and say, how do I step into my sovereignty, my own power, and know that my mom's story or whatever, 
whatever anybody labels me to be is not my story, that I need to flip the script, that I can produce, direct, and do whatever I need to do within that script. And the power there was not to seek, no longer to seek anything. And it was finding complete acceptance within myself for who I was and not chasing anything any longer because that is where it all goes wrong. I mean, I, I shared with you that I formalized School of Life at 40. Gosh, I, I can tick off a lot of milestones and successes in my life, but I was never, ever happy. And it was because this vessel here, yeah, this heart vessel, wasn't full. I was in my head, in my ego, operating from lack. And the only time when, and this is the most important tip I want to give, is when we honor our wounds. And when we are able to face it boldly with courage and we say, I honor you. I want you to be raised up and say, you have served me. And to heal through the wounds of the past, because I call um, it the wow factor. There's wisdom of wounds. Our wounds give us the, they're the catalyst actually for us to move to the next level within ourselves. So that's really for me, the most important way to get back to home, to your heart space. Yes, yes, we have to own our power. I want to just share some comments with you. I have um, Paulette is saying that acceptance and self-awareness are key. Avril is saying finding complete acceptance. Shahida is saying this is so powerful. It becomes about you. Yumna says, hey, Anissa. Uh, Gandhi is saying that we have to honor our wounds, which is exactly what you're saying, right? Because our wounds can become the springboard for everything that we're meant to be, for all that we will accomplish. I love the fact that you admit it. The source of your success was driven from a place of brokenness. Many of us seek success, um, riches, uh, all sorts of things to fill the void of the trauma of childhood or from our parents. And mm -hmm. so once we identify that we're hurt, because we have to acknowledge it, we have to say that this situation hurt me, my mom, who was supposed to love me, damaged me. Now what mm -hmm. do I do with this? All right. So let's go a little bit deeper because... After I reconciled with my mom, I was already at a place where I had been so broken that I had sat on my bathroom floor with a bottle of tablets and a gallon of juice. I was ready to tap out on life. I was 25, 26. And I was like, oh, this happened, that happened. Like all of these bad things happened. Um, you know, the attempted uh, molestation by my stepfather, uh, sexual inappropriate actions from other trusted men, family, teachers, um, a teenage mom at 19, a, a, a marriage at 21 that, that, that had domestic abuse uh, where I had another child and all of these, all of these things just drove me to my bathroom floor. And um, what I recognized that I was really sitting in victimhood not taking responsibility for the choices that led me to my bathroom floor. My mom didn't push me there. Yes, we had a broken relationship, but I made the choice to be a rebellious teen. I made the choice to have a sexual relationship before I was married and, and got pregnant. I made the choice to get married. Yes, I was running from home. Yes, I was running from an environment that I didn't feel reinforced me as a person or built my self-esteem. And I was running into what I hoped would be my savior, what I hoped would be good enough to fill the void in me that would make me a better person that would finally validate me as a person. And I made all these bad decisions from a place of brokenness. But it wasn't until 
I took responsibility for those choices and recognized that it was me the entire mm-hmm. time. Like it was me. And once I did that, um, I went, even in doing that, I went to the far extreme in me. So with my two kids, right? So I had all these experiences that I didn't want them to have. So I became overprotective as a mother. We're just, we're just going to be real. I was overprotective. Sleepovers were a no-no. Even some social environments, most social environments were a no-no because I knew of the danger that existed in each of those environments. And wanting to prevent my kids from having the trauma of sexual abuse, having the trauma of um, having to deal with people that should nurture them, taking advantage of them, I went to the furthest extreme instead of teaching them how to handle themselves should those situations arise. Mm. So the mother who is saying, I'll never be like my mother because I made some of the very same mistakes my mother. To the mother out there who is saying that I will never be my mother, what do you have to say to her? (laughs) You are your mother in so many ways we want to run away from that but we can't it's part of our dna it's innate but as you so rightfully and powerfully say we don't have to consciously lead our lives in the way that our parents have lived theirs and i too (laughs) have very recently had to make a bold decision to leave my husband who I love dearly. However, coming back to the same prostitution versus prostituting myself in my relationship, I was giving all of myself and modeling how a marriage should not be. I have a daughter today who is feisty simply because she sees her mother model. Guess what? Behaviors that her granny actually modeled because that's all her mother knows. It's the example and modeling that she learned. The same with my sons. My husband is, well, we are going through the divorce process right now. And I wanted to do what Gwyneth Paltrow refers to as a conscious uncoupling. I want to leave this relationship honoring my husband for the gifts that he's given me and our kids in the time that we've been together. And it's a long time. It's 18 years almost of marriage. And I think it's 23 years of being together. But Now to leave a man that I actually love dearly. Why? Because I need to honor that I've learned to start loving myself. And I've now set the boundaries between being selfless on the one end of the scale to being selfish. And those are all just labels again. But the more important part is having self-respect. And I needed to, no, I'm not needed because need is again from a place of lack. I believed that I have to model the right relationship mirrors for my kids so that when they go out into the world, it's not about protecting them, as you have stated, it's about building EQ, emotional intelligence and social intelligence and that adversity quotient that is going to help them make the right decisions. But what was I'm going to use the word toxic, even though my relationship with my husband was not toxic in the sense of we were arguing and fighting, but more that the modeling was repeating a generational cycle that my husband has come from. And guess what? I went ahead and said, I do not want my relationship to mirror my mother-in-law's marriage. And what is the law of attraction saying? (laughs) What you think and feel and project will come right back at you. So whether it was my mother's mirroring in my type of parenting that was coming through, or with all due respect to my husband, him 
having that model that the mother is the matriarch of the family and the mother is the strong one and can just take it all on. And I was like, no, where's the self-respect here? So that's where I'm now. And we haven't yet finalized the divorce, but I am pleased to say that, yes, the first few weeks of the decision was quite unraveling for both of us. But today I can comfortably say I am now modeling for my kids what it is to have self-respect. That is so... I mean, like, I keep hearing honor because you're honoring your your husband, but you're also honoring yourself and yes. you're honoring your kids, right? And so when we think about our moms and the relationships that we had and the trauma that we endured based on the decisions that they made or how they handled us, I think it's important for us to recognize that um, being a mother, we not only carry that uh, cycle, those generational curses in parenting, but in other aspects of our lives, our marriages, our careers, our choice mm -hmm. of friends. Like we show up as our mothers in so many different ways, which is why it's important for us to extend that grace. I want to share some of these comments with you. Zaida, I, I'm not sure if that's how, yeah, she is saying, hi, Anissa, Zaida. thank you for sharing your story. It brings back many childhood memories. Thank you for the reflections. Judy Miller is saying, I am my mother's child, but I can make decisions to become better. Yumna is saying, we still have the power to not make the same mistakes our mothers did. Paulette is saying that I find myself opening my mouth and hearing my mother come out on so many occasions that you need to have a healthy EQ. Shahida is saying it comes down to being absolutely honest with yourself. Shahida, I just mm -hmm. want to take that and run with it because when we sit in our power, we're no longer victims and we're looking at ourselves and how we have contributed. The final mm -hmm. thing I want us to talk about um, today really is on owning that power and that comes with self-leadership. When we started our conversation today, you talked about self-love self-acceptance and self-leadership. We've touched self-love, we've touched self-acceptance, and now we talk about self-leadership. At the moment that I found myself on my bathroom floor contemplating taking my life, um, two important things happened. I looked up and coming down out of the recessed lights were these rays that reminded me that um, the God that I served was there with me and that my experiences were promised to give me hope for a better future. And I had two kids whose lives I didn't want to destroy. They would be known as the children whose mom uh, left them, killed herself. You know, kids can be so hard and bullying and I didn't want to tarnish them that way. But I, two days after I made the courageous decision to get up off my bathroom floor and not take my life, I found a mentor. And let me tell you what's so exciting about that. I didn't look for this mentor. This mentor approached me, and it is often said that when the student is ready, the teacher yeah. appears. My yeah. teacher appeared, and we worked together to rebuild my life. But my teacher didn't tell me what to do. My teacher guided me, but asked very frightening questions, right? My teacher asked me who I was, and I started to read aloud that, you know, I was a mom, I was a daughter, I was an aunt, I was a friend. And my teacher was like, no, I'm not asking you about your roles or your titles. I want to know what makes you up. And I couldn't answer. And, you know, mm -hmm. he said, that's okay. It's okay to admit that you don't know who you are, even at 25, 26. But the good thing about that is that tells me that we have a blank piece of paper mm -hmm. that you can create who you want to become on. You can write the characteristics that you want to be seen in you. You can... You can look at the behaviors that you want to emulate. You can look at how you want to live your life and then build this life. That's self-leadership. That's yeah. understanding who you are and then understanding where you want to go and the action steps that it takes to get there. And it was a 10 year journey from going to, from a place of overwhelm to a place of ownership 
for me, it was a 10 year journey of releasing trauma, releasing the longing and the desire for my mom to hold me and tell me I love you, releasing the desire for my mom to hold me in, next to her in the bed and cuddle me up as I saw so many times on television, mothers would do with their children. Uh, it was a process for me to release my mom from not sitting down and doing homework with me like so many other uh, parents did with their children. It was a process of releasing her from every cut if I got. I got beaten for everything. It was a process of healing those wounds. It was a process of understanding that she struggled with her own life. She was really just trying to survive in life. It was a struggle mm -hmm. to accept that and to believe that. So when it comes to self-acceptance, what are the greatest things that we can do to become more intentional and to become more compassionate so that we can release the trauma? You spoke about having a mentor and that resonated and brought up something for me immediately because it's also been more than a decade long journey to self and self leadership has been something that I'm always passionate about. And, you know, it came naturally for me because I was this optimist and I could start selling things at nine years old. So I took care of myself from a very young age and could sustain myself as early as paying my way, so to speak, for where I was growing up with my guardian parents at from Middle school, I think that's what you call it, middle school, and until obviously I left. But the essence for me of self-leadership really comes from being able to release those wounds. And last year, I was retrenched, I think it was October. And in October last year, it was like my very first experience of a retrenchment. It was like, okay. I was celebrating it firstly. <laughs> it wasn't the norm response to a retrenchment. I must just say, you know, most people are like, okay, what now? Where, where to from here? What do I do? How am I going to survive? I was like, yes, the gift of time to pause, to reflect, because I started working it so young and yes, it's my time. Then God decides to pass on an opportunity through God rest his soul. One of my previous bosses, he wanted me to come back and work there. And I was like, God, are you testing me? I thought this was the time to pause because I had these dreams of opening up my own business for more than a decade long. I think I've been a qualified coach about my daughter's 11, so almost 12 years. And it's like, I couldn't pursue this because I was telling myself the story. No, I'm the primary breadwinner at home and we can't be both self-employed individuals. And I've got to be, you know, playing this role of stepping up and running the household. So I can't fulfill my dreams and pursue it. The catalyst is by far the retrenchment because I was like, Anissa, your natural bias is you are always finding solutions. You do not see the negative side of things. You see adversity as opportunity always. And then it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You cannot live your entire life like that because some of my childhood memories, I can't even remember. Even from school, I couldn't remember it. And I suppressed it, right? Because it was like, just move on, find the solution. Then I found, like you say, I didn't go seeking for him. But my coach, Rashad Ahmed, that I found via LinkedIn, he was writing posts and they were screaming at me, you know. And I was like, I messaged him and I said, Rashad, you're going to be my coach. And I'm not wanting you to coach me because I have goals. I'm not wanting to tick off the next goal or bucket list, but I want you to walk the journey with me to feel through the wounds of my past so that I can come back to self-leadership by not being in survival, the basic needs. I want to get to a self-actualized position of, I know what it is to set boundaries for myself. I know what it is to say no. I know what it is to say no more. <laughs> it stops here and it stops now. And so part of that journey was doing the child 
um, childhood or child timeline trauma healing, that was the most profound experience because I had to go back to my inner child. And one of the practices that I loved was the whole Oponopono um, meditation. And that meditation, I believe the history is around, um, it was actually for hardened criminals that had to kind of, they wanted to see how they would support hardened criminals to become rehabilitated. And it goes in with connecting within your heart space again and saying, I'm sorry, to that inner child, you know, I, I, I thank you. I love you. That was hard to do. You know, it was so difficult to say, I'm sorry, Anissa. Um, thank you, Anissa. Whatever you and whoever you were has served you up until now. And I love you, Anissa. To say those words, I believe, is when you finally get to a space of being self-actualized and moving into self-leadership, when you do not look outside of yourself and pass blame for whatever it is in your space, you always, always introspect and move out of your ego space and lead with compassion, even if someone's treating you badly, because you know better, you've been there before. So that's pretty much it for me. I see uh, Felicia is saying, wow, from survival, to self-actualization, yeah. um, <clears throat> you know, and if we were just, it's, it's not a simple thing to do, even though it sounds really easy, because I remember the same process, Anissa, of standing in the mirror and saying, I forgive you, and the tears were just flowing from my eyes. I forgive you, Donnie. I forgive you. Mm-hmm. I love you. Like, just, you know, just just those giving myself the gift of my own love, my own forgiveness, um, my own compassion. Like even today, if I make a mistake, oh, okay, I made a mistake. It is what it is. So I forgive myself. Um, you know, I let it go. That's a journey and a process in and of itself. And so many of us are uncomfortable expressing that love to ourselves, mm-hmm. but it starts there. Mm-hmm. It really starts with owning our power and not giving someone else the power to impact us by needing their love more than we need our own love. So we have to recognize where we are. We have to love ourselves where we are. We have to understand the things that conditioned us to determine if we need reconditioning. Do I believe what I believe or do I believe something else, right? So we have to take the time to intimately get to know who we are, what our triggers are, how our experiences have framed us, what's going to be required to break those curses. And that is going to really take self-leadership. But you speak about triggers. And I just want to say the moment you are triggered, remember, we all have ego. We have duality and polarity. There's always ego in all of us. But when you are triggered, that is your sign that you need to relearn and unlearn what's still needing to be, I think you said reconditioned. Yes. Yes. And that's, there's power in that. So don't, don't judge yourself if you're in your ego space. It's part of us. Yes. But understand that you need to be consciously and acutely aware when you are triggered, because then that means there's an unhealed part of you. Yes. So Judy is saying that standing in our power is so necessary to make the rough decisions I have to be honest about me. It's okay if I make mistakes, but I have to move on. So yes, thank you so much for that, Judy. So we have been here for almost 45 minutes and this conversation feels as if it's just, it just started. For those of you watching and who will catch the replay, I've placed Anissa's website as well as her LinkedIn, uh, the, the, the link to her LinkedIn page, I really sound so funny, right? The link to her <laughs> LinkedIn page in the comment section for you to just click and follow the journey of this amazing woman who is doing transformative work all over the world. Right now, Anissa is in South Africa. It is coming on 10 o'clock our time. So we're going to wrap PM. We're going to wrap this conversation up. Uh, are there any last words for our audience, Anissa? 
Well, I, I feel that the essence of our journey is to move back into our heart space because that's where we are closest to our divinity. We are one with our creator when we are in our heart space. So take the time out for you. Understand when you are being triggered and take the time out to heal. Healing is, there's no destination. And we've got to constantly pause to unlearn and relearn a new way of being. And that's okay too. And live life to the fullest. Don't live our life in suffering. Live life for today because we know tomorrow is not promised, right? Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Saida wants to tell you thank you for sharing the power of self-love and your journey to discovery. Paulette is saying that she thoroughly enjoyed today's conversation. Felicia is saying healing is no destination. So good. Judy is saying that the speaker, meaning you, gave some valuable information. And so thank you. Thank you so much, Anissa. Thank you so much to our, our watching audience live and also who will be catching the replay. Uh, we appreciate your comments, your engagement. And be sure to hang out with us next week, Sunday, as we continue the conversation, Grace for Mothers, throughout the month of November. Shahida is saying, thank you so much. A lot to learn from this woman who is healing to find herself again. Uh, Anissa, you have a powerful testimony. You, your work is transformative and it can help so many people. Thank you for your transparency, your honesty, and being so free with your advice. So if guys, if you need help, you can link up Anissa. Her website is there as well as her LinkedIn page. As always, I'm Coach Deguessa com. Resources are also available there for you. Be sure to stay connected to the Evolving Woman Facebook group. If you're not in the group, what are you waiting for? Take care, guys, and enjoy the rest of the day. Blessings. Thank you. Greetings. Bye.